Buongiorno everybody and welcome! Thank you so much for waking up so early in the morning after a fantastic cruise, I'm told it was very good, I didn't come. To come here and spend a good 20 minutes about, uh, thinking about verifiable credentials. Verifiable credentials, as you might have had a feeling by looking at the agenda here, is a very important topic. As practitioners, we absolutely cannot ignore it. However, when you listen to the enthusiasts talking about this, sometimes you hear some pretty puzzling statements, like uh, centralized databases will uh, disappear, or uh, applications will be incapable of saving uh, personal identifiable information. And extraordinary claims call for extraordinary proof. But again, when you listen to these people, I often get this vibe, which uh, is well represented by this meme. I don't know if you are familiar with the series. There is this meme in which there is uh, some uh, drawing instruction. And the first step uh, is a silhouette, there it is. And the second step is uh, the entire thing. Just like, OK, how did you teach me anything here? And if you, like, again, not everyone, to be fair, not everyone. Actually, it's luckily less and less. But some of these people, when they do presentations, they do one slide saying uh, centralized databases are bad because of a single point of failure. And the next slide, is 169 did methods with nothing in the middle. Like, how am I supposed to evaluate those statements? So today, today I'll attempt something pretty ambitious. I'm going to try to derive in just 19 minutes from traditional IIM primitives the concept of verifiable credentials. And hopefully, that will ground us and it will make us able to actually think about some of those statements and see how that turns out. Now, this is a good moment to say that this is uh, me, good old Vittorio. I'm not selling you anything. And uh, also, you will hear me poke hole in some of those things. But that doesn't mean at all that I don't believe in the technology. I believe that the technology not only is important, it is uh, necessary. However, if we adopt it for the wrong reasons, then we set ourselves to fail. And so I just wanted to do my part to try to bring some uh, pragmatism in this topic. All on board? No one left? Good. Good sign. Very good. I'll start by telling you that you have been lied to. And uh, there is a very good chance that for many of you, I was the one lying to you. <laughs> if you go back to the days in which you first were introduced to modern identity claims, based identity, you probably heard a variant of this metaphor in which you have someone that wants booze, and in order to get booze, they have to present some document from some government entity which proves their age. And the outcome is your liver fails. Um, and that's exactly how identity works, right? How our claims about base identity works? No, it isn't. Here, there is a how we actually do things. And let's pick up an idea. It could take pretty much any protocol. Here, you have a relying party that sells wine. You try to get to the page that will sell you wine, and this page somehow says, OK, you need to be authenticated, so I'm going to send you somewhere to authenticate with a list of the things that I need in order for you to perform the operation that you want. And typically here, what happens is that you get authenticated, you get an artifact, say an ID token. This ID token, I know it's small, but it's just for giving you an idea, contains a number of attributes, including, for example, my age, which is relevant in here, and the things like the audience, like uh, for whom this token has been uh, crafted. And then I just present it, and uh, once again, I abuse of my anatomy. So what happens here is that uh, that's not at all what we are doing in real life. In real life, you don't pick up the phone every time you want to buy wine and call a government clerk somewhere, maybe in a different time zone, and say, hey, I'm here in shop XYZ Pizza Fiki uh, software, and I'd like to buy wine. And the other one, OK, can you tell me the client ID? OK, what scopes do you want? Of course, it does not happen. It does not happen at all. But you shouldn't feel bad about having been lied to, because this is by design. The problems that we solve in modern identity require the identity provider or the federation provider, anything in the middle there, to run business logic, 
authorization logic. Customize the things for the particular transaction that you're doing to give a chance to administrators to do whatever policy they want to apply. So when people try to guilt you into saying, oh, how dare you having something centralized, don't let them. Because if you are solving those problems, you have to have such a component. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't abuse this architecture and sometimes use it in situations in which uh, something else would be better. And that doesn't mean that there aren't scenarios that we could better tackle with different primitives that instead today we are limited by the state of current technology. So say that we really want to reproduce online the real documents. What do we need to do to change? The first thing is we've got to lose the audience. We want to be able to get uh, an artifact. I'll stop calling it a token at this point. We want to get an artifact which uh, can be used with multiple relying parties without having to go all the way back every single time. Not only that, we need to be able to save this artifact somewhere in a place which I will randomly call the wallet, uh, in, so that uh, we can keep it locally and use it whenever we need without having to call home. So great, progress. Now we have a problem. The audience was there for a very good reason, which is to limit the blast radius if someone steals that thing. You don't want them to impersonate you everywhere. So what do we do? There is another good trick, which is pretty old, like we've been doing this in identity for a while, which is proof of possession. We can tie the use of that particular artifact to a, um, to a particular instance, for example, a wallet. So say that uh, I have a, a key, actually a key pair, but I have only 14 minutes, so can't go into the details. Say that I have a key and an identifier of this key. And say that when I ask for that artifact, I specify the identifier of a key that I want to use. And so once I cache that thing in there, that thing will contain inside the sign, the part, a reference to the key. And now when I use that thing, I don't use it as is. I wrap it in a signature which I've performed with my own system. So now the relying party receives these things, checks the internal signature, yes, it's coming from the authority, finds the reference to the external key, check that the signature has been performed with the same key, yes, the sender is indeed the one that got this thing issued in the first place. So we solved that other problem. Now, of course, I'm skipping a gargantuan amount of details, but this one I cannot skip. Today, online, we can do things that we cannot do with paper and plastic. Like when we ask for a token for a transaction, we can completely customize the token to the exact specifications of what we need. So we can reduce the number of attributes to exactly what we need. But with a plastic, you cannot. Let's say that if you are buying something that needs to prove your age, you are also going to disclose your home address. But, but here, of course, we now have the same problem because we have a cached token. So there is magic that I will not specify in here, but there are very good sessions during this week, and I invite you to go and check them out. There is magic that brings us back the ability to do selective disclosure, even if we have tokens cached in our wallet. So just want to make sure that we know that it's not like um, Verifiable credential introduce this capability. We always had this capability, and now we need to somewhat get it back because of the idea of caching tokens in our own wallet. OK, bad news are not over. Turns out that we didn't invent verifiable credential right now, but someone else did already. And funnily enough, a lot of people did. Uh, here, there is just like a selection of the most important standard bodies that already published the documents on this topic. And in fact, uh, like in particular, the W3C defined the terminology that you normally use in this space, which I'm now going to introduce. Now, the user here is the holder. The identity provider or attribute provider is the issuer. The verifier is uh, what performs the function of a relying party. What we have in there is a verifiable credential, and what we use when we actually use that thing to perform whatever operation we want is a verifiable presentation. That's the terminology. And then there is the verifiable data registry, which is more magic. It's basically the place where you keep uh, your metadata and your corresponding keys and your trust information. We won't go into the details because we really don't have time. And just to give you a feeling of how complicated this space can be, 
like uh, here where it's just like uh, overimposed on the system, some of the, um, how to say, what the cooks are doing in here. Like for example, verifiable credential as a data format has been defined by the W3C. But the ISO uh, is building an equivalent, like a same outcome uh, credential, which is my mobile driving license. And then uh, the way in which you issue it to wallets, there is uh, OpenID for VC, there are things from W3C. Uh, the presentations, we have uh, DIDCOM from DIF, uh, we have OpenID for VP on VP, where like, ISO has its own ways of presenting things. And you get my point. Like, uh, here, this space uh, is, uh, I dare say, remember my opinion, not my employer, over-specified, too many things. But at the same time, I'm biased because I'm uh, on the board, but uh, I think that the OpenID Foundation is doing really good work in here because uh, now it's uh, doing a lot of consolidation, trying to use what's good already out there and actually lead to some interoperable outcomes. So, great. <sighs> and we are only halfway. Fantastic. So now we finally have some pragmatic understanding of what verifiable credential means. So let's look at some of the most puzzling statements in this space. And I, I just picked those three because I think that they are very representative. The first one is the centralized databases will disappear. And typically, the, the first slide that they show in their presentation is uh, user attributes and user credential stores. So I'll start with that. Let's say that uh, I'm applying for a job in the US. And let's say that the job requires a master degree. I have two. So I go back to my university, which is in there. I get uh, a verifiable credential of my diploma. And I can present this. And at this point, I can just show it. Can the university delete that record from their database? I ask you just to see if you are still awake. Can they? No. no, no, no. I brought so many ice creams uh, back in the day gel in a gelateria in North uh, Ita Italy for paying for my uh, college. They better never, ever delete that thing. So I'd say that uh, that thing is not a candidate. Like maybe they are thinking about a different database. So let's say, let's focus on the employer. The employer that receives the verifiable presentation and now knows that yes, I am someone with a master's degree. Can they delete that information? Also, no. Because I say that in five years, I find myself in some big trouble. And given that this thing, like being hired for a certain position, which requires a master's degree, puts you in a different lane for immigration, I got my green card and then my citizenship faster because of that. Uh, so the FBI will come back and say, employer, did you do due diligence? Did you know that this guy was going to be a problem in here? And so now they need to show that they did do due diligence. And they cannot show a Boolean saying, see this Boolean? I set this Boolean five years ago when I checked a couple of signatures. It doesn't work that way. They still need to remember some of this stuff. Then here the advantage is that if I can do selective disclosure, and uh, in my particular case, instead of just showing them a photocopy of my diploma, I can select the attributes that I will show. But what is in my diploma that I want to hide from my new employer? So we also needed to look at the practical angle of this stuff. And then just to go back uh, on centralized stuff, there are flows that cannot go through the user. If my health provider has my blood type and I get caught in an accident, I cannot uh, consent to release my blood type. Get, they better give me a transfusion fast. So that stuff also is another database that uh, cannot be deleted. Now, all the decentralized people know that whenever we go to dinner, I will ask them, so which database did you delete today? <laughs> they never give me an answer, but I'm open to the possibility. So if you hear this and you think of something, please find me. I'm easy to recognize. OK. So user is in control of their own identity. Ah, this one is such good PR when you say it. It's like, yes, look at you. Now, the thing here is, uh, indeed, it's true when you are thinking about the identity provider. The ability of uh, hiding from your issuer when and with whom you use your credentials is huge. It's very, very important. 
but it kind of stops there. Because I here say that I have my driving license. Again, I need to prove that uh, I am old enough to see certain content on the internet. And so I can present this thing. And now people feel very empowered because they can use their personal key for signing this stuff. But the authority is still the Department of Motor Vehicles. And if last week I was driving drunk and they revoked my driving license and they revoke it, in my VC and in my presentations, then I will not be able to see the content that I want to see. So I'm not that sovereign, after all. And the other part is like uh, when you look at the things that like, you are issuing yourself, you can think of like you are in control of your identity in terms of life cycle. You can revoke access. Once again, not so much, because uh, the moment in which the verifier sees this anything, now they can save it. You can put a bit that says, please don't save, but that bit will have the same effect as the stop sign in my private road where I live in the US. That stop sign was placed by the homeowner association. As an Italian driver, I don't recognize it. <laughs> I don't stop to that thing. Like, I don't care. I, I just go. And so here, the solution is not technology. The solution here is law. You need to make it illegal for the verifier to save things that are not uh, germane to the business that they are conducting. But it's not a technology problem. So, user is in control? A bit. Like with any provider, yes. And then finally, <sighs> privacy will improve is another huge one. Um, here, it's kind of hard because, uh, again, often people think that uh, VCs introduced selective disclosure, but they didn't. We, have, we had uh, very, um, selective disclosure for a decade or more. It's just that usually the verifier asks for as much as they can get away with. And so the fact that if you have ability to shrink, which we already had, the list of attributes that you send, doesn't mean that those will be shrunk. It is true that if you are comparing these to plastic, then yes, we'll be able to manufacture a copy of a particular document, which is a subset of the things that you'd get from plastic or paper, which is good. But again, how many times do you do it during the day? It's important, it's high value, but it's not like word changing. And the other thing is, Today, a lot of verifiers, actually most verifiers, will not ask you to prove your identity by taking a selfie with your driving license, unless their business requires it. In some cases, you do need that level of assurance, but in most cases, you don't. Now imagine having a comparable level of assurance behind just a top. And now think every time you, identity people, when you get the dialogue that says, uh, would you like to reject all cookies, manage cookies, accept all cookies, what do you do? Don't lie. Lie to me, but don't lie to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so here, basically, what might happen is that uh, unless uh, issuers, and some issuers will regulate this and have uh, a low list of relying parties, but some others will probably won't. And so what might happen is that uh, the total amount of uh, privacy in the universe, if we are not careful, will go down. Because uh, we'll disclose important, verified information about ourselves more often. Again, this is not a given, but it's a danger that we need to be aware of. And let me stress, selective disclosure alone won't solve the problem. Because it's, until it's a voluntary act, hard to get people to opt in. So, that said, I stand by what I said at the very beginning. We need verifiable credentials to happen. And there are things that only verifiable credentials can do, and those things are very important. To me, the top one is that we do need the ability to express our identity, to disclose our verified attributes without the issuer knowing. That is like a civil liberty. It's a right. And Today, we mostly play transactional games online, but eventually, as we get more and more of our life online, we'll need to be able to express our identity the way we do it offline. And so, it is fundamental that for the use cases that require this, that we'll do it. I'm sorry, I'm almost done.
yeah, but I kind of feel anxious if you're like, can I finish without a, a vulture? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other is that the, um, the moment in which the users will actually have in their wallet in a very powerful credential can be a game changer. Put yourself in the shoes of a verifier. The ability to rely on such a credential that can be actually managed elsewhere, uh, that someone else is dealing with uh, uh, recovery and all of that stuff, it's huge. It's really powerful. But to me, given that I'm a blue collar and an architect, perhaps the most important is this one. If we want to achieve the scale that uh, true use of documents online requires, we really should not rely on an architecture that requires us to call home every single time. Not only is it bad for privacy, but it also, and here I'll say a trope that every architect says eventually in their career, does not scale. <laughs> So we started here. My hope is that in these little 20 minutes, I helped to bridge a bit this. And of course, 20 minutes are far from enough. Luckily, there are a lot of really good sessions this week about verifiable credential. I invite you to go check them out. And now, the usual slide that I always use for closing at EIC. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank we you. have um, four questions for you, which is quite a lot. So I you certainly you raised want. the awareness for verifiable credentials. I'll just highlight one of those. Um, uh, verifiable, credential, ver verifiable credentials may be better used to solve the KYC, know your customer problem. Are the problems you're highlighting a result of applying it to a different use case, authentication? Someone is asking. Mm, um, I'd say that uh, this is actually one of the interesting aspects of all this. Like, uh, very often, when I look at uh, what we are doing in this space, I feel like we are doing what Tolkien has done when he wrote The Cimmerillion. Have you ever read The Cimmerillion? Oh, OK, someone <laughs> at my age. Like, Tolkien basically wrote like, uh, Middle Earth, all of these interesting adventures. And then he wrote basically a Bible with uh, the entire history, a very boring history of the entire uh, Middle Earth. And it's completely fictional. None, none of that exists. It's an entire book of fiction about stuff that didn't happen yet. So to me, it's important to get to be one of those things in which uh, we don't just have little pilots uh, here and there in the world, but we have a large scale use. We have lots of people with those credentials in their pockets so we can see what the use cases will large emerge. Large scale pilots like European Union is now uh, starting with. Maybe. Which, for me, is yeah. another good example of like, people keep saying it, but mm -hmm. until it's not on the, in the pockets and the phone of people, yeah. for me, it's just like a lot of uh, nice talk. Yeah. So we need to actually Okay, get we need to, to go this. on in this. Uh, we could spend all day. Thank very you very much. Thank you. Uh, nice to have you.